This is Epicenter Bitcoin, episode 103, with guests Emin Gunsir and Itai Al. This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the unplugged NFC hardware wallet. Half peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. And by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash EPICENTER and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by Gun Seeder and Itai Eyal from Cornell University. They have come up with a very interesting proposal to scale Bitcoin, which is called Bitcoin NG, NG for next generation. It's one of the most interesting proposals because uh, it can, this has the potential to change the scalability game in Bitcoin. Gentlemen, we are very pleased to have you on the show. Very nice to be here. Thank you. So um, we already had uh, Goon and Itai on our show uh, before, but for our viewers that have not seen that show, perhaps we, uh, it would be best to have an introduction from both of you. Can we start with you, Goon? Uh, sure. I'm an associate professor at Cornell University. I have been uh, a professor for about 14 years. I've been generally looking at peer-to-peer -peer systems and self-organizing distributed systems for a long time now. Um, I ended up building a peer-to-peer uh, -peer currency in 2002-2003 that uh, came long before Bitcoin and had a distributed uh, mint. Uh, wasn't as successful. Um, but uh, So I've been very interested and in it's been great to see Bitcoin's success and uh, we've been looking at some of uh, Bitcoin's issues that it has faced over the years. We've identified some, we've ident come up with some fixes. And uh, the latest in this line of work is uh, Bitcoin NG. Uh, I'm also the director, one of the co-directors for IC3, a new NSF funded uh, initiative looking at cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. And Itai, can we have your introduction? I am a postdoctoral associate in uh, Cornell for the last couple of years. Uh, started working uh, seriously on uh, on Bitcoin in Cornell. Uh, we published the, the selfish uh, mining attack that revealed uh, some uh, disconcerting facts about the security of Bitcoin. And later on, I had some better news uh, with the, the miners' dilemma. Uh, it, it turns out that there is a game played among uh, open mining pools and uh, that might uh, reduce the insecurity due to centralization, which is something I guess uh, we all lose sleep for. Uh, and uh, yeah, currently uh, we're doing this NG project, which we'll talk about. Okay. So to begin with, can we just have your opinion on why it is important to scale Bitcoin? And what are the fundamental limitations that prevent vanilla Bitcoin from scaling well? So I think this is a very, very simple, uh, it's a great question to start with. Um, and, and the motivation to scale up should be, should be self-evident. We want Bitcoin to be, uh, or blockchain technologies, to compete with existing fintech technologies. And at the moment, um, existing fintech systems like the Visa Transaction Processing Network can handle really large amounts of uh, volume. And uh, blockchain technologies have not been able to do this because of the very nature uh, of the blockchain update protocol. Um, essentially, the entire protocol is self-tuning and it ends up issuing a uh, block with a maximum size every so often. So that every so often is called the block interval. And for Bitcoin, that's about 10 minutes. Uh, the protocol is geared to make sure that blocks on average come every 10 minutes. And there's a maximum block size. So every 10 minutes, you're going to get a block that's uh, one megabyte or less at the moment. So what that ends up meaning is you end up getting a few transactions per second overall. And uh, that is the sort of the crux of the, 
the scalability issue because we would really like to be able to support more than a few transactions per second if blockchain technologies are going to support, say, nation states or go global or uh, end up doing tiny microtransactions and enable a completely different kind of commerce. So we'd like to be able to push the envelope with blockchain technologies and this uh, block size combined with block interval ends up limiting us. I mean, the scalability debate has been sort of divided against two opinions. One is that Bitcoin should be able to handle, you know, probably like an infinite number of transactions. And on the other side uh, is that Bitcoin should only handle high volume transactions and we should expect other systems to be built on top. So you're of the opinion that Bitcoin should scale and that we should be able to rely on Bitcoin to on the protocol to, to handle as many transactions per second and that, you know, having systems built on top of it is not necessarily desirable? Well, okay, so that's an interesting question. I would say that we're agnostic on that question. Um, that is, we would like to develop technologies for um, handling large volumes of transactions. Um, we're not necessarily pushing it onto the Bitcoin core. Um, it would be nice, in my opinion, to see uh, high scalability actually adopted into the protocol as long as the, it doesn't come with a high cost. That is, it doesn't qualitatively change uh, the Bitcoin uh, sort of landscape. Um, on the other hand, we're completely okay with scalability technologies being implemented on side chains on, or, or using some other mechanisms that are off the main Bitcoin blockchain as well. We are really agnostic. Uh, the people who have been pushing against uh, making Bitcoin scale are pushing against making Bitcoin scale because they perceive the changes that have been proposed so far to come with a cost. They believe that if we were to adopt, say, larger block sizes, that will cause more centralization, more unfairness for miners, you know, they're, they're, and they are right in, in having those concerns. So that debate is a real genuine debate with reasonable opinions on both sides. And, um, and uh, you know, we, we don't really, you know, so as long as the, the costs aren't there, then I think everybody involved in that debate would jump on and say, yeah, we should adopt whatever technology comes, uh, uh, brings us better, better, better uh, uh, throughputs and lower latencies. So we, we are not really pushing for either side of that debate. We're bringing something entirely new to the table and uh, we are happy to see it either in the core or on side chains or, or on some other mechanism. Itai, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I, I agree with what Gun said. I, I want to emphasize that the scale that we're talking about uh, really means that we're going to need both things. We want to have a highly scalable uh, blockchain or blockchains if you use several of them. And on top of them, you may have uh, services that do uh, uh, transactions outside the chain. Uh, but whenever you go outside the chain, there are trade-offs, security trade-offs that are suitable in certain cases and unsuitable in others. And you need to go back. Uh, you need to go back to the chain every so often. So to to really have the system handle high, a very high volume of of, uh, of transactions, you need both of these. You need very efficient uh, blockchains and off-chain mechanisms. So then let's perhaps go right into uh, Bitcoin NG. Can you give us an overview of what is Bitcoin NG and how is it fundamentally different from Bitcoin Core? Yeah, sure. The, um, uh, Bitcoin NG uh, allows us uh, to remove uh, the bandwidth and latency limitations that are caused due to the properties of the, of the standard Bitcoin protocol. Uh, we make a change that allows us to uh, send transactions as fast as the network propagation time is. This means that uh, you can ex you need to wait for as long as, according to the network size, you don't need to wait 10 minutes. If you think it takes 30 seconds to pass a message from one side of the network to the other, this is what you need to wait uh, roughly for your transaction to be placed on the, on the blockchain. And as for bandwidth, we can go as fast as the as the nodes that run Bitcoin can run. Uh, whereas with Bitcoin today, uh, you have limitations uh, that come from the protocol. If you try to increase uh, the efficiency uh, just by tuning the protocol, you're going to uh, hit a point where security uh, starts to drop. Okay. So if I could just rephrase that, what, what essentially is 
you remove the limitations of the protocol and you're now limited only by the capacity of a network and the capacity of networks to to of nodes to process transactions so you know you could look at this and say it basically looks like uh http for example you know you're limited by the speed of the network and you're limited by the uh, a server's ability to to push out information to a client um you know not in the same architecture but is this some sort of similar and then regular protocols over TCP IP? But that's a great analogy. I think it's very, very similar. Think of it as, I don't know if people remember the old days of Usenet when you used to download uh, the news articles uh, every so often. You would connect to another uh, uh, UUCP host and, and fetch everything every so often. And um, I think that's akin to the, op the operation of the current blockchain. And, um, and the way we change it is entirely onto, uh, just as, as you said, it's much more similar to the web uh, compared to Usenet. So instead of, uh, of downloading in batches, we are doing a, sort of a, a vetting process online as fast as the nodes can process the vetted transactions. So just for, just for uh, clarification in, in, in this talk, when you, when you say bandwidth, uh, you don't really mean bandwidth for information traveling between two nodes, you really mean bandwidth, meaning how many MBs of data can the blockchain come to consensus at per unit of time, right? Exactly. Okay. And uh, and you say that uh, with Bitcoin NG, uh, when when a when a when a user does a transaction, then the amount of time that the transaction needs to enter into a block is limited by only by the diameter of the network. Meaning, if the network can uh, broadcast this transaction to all the nodes, create the block and broadcast the block to all the nodes. And if that takes only 30 seconds, then the user will have his transaction in a block in 30 seconds itself instead of 10 minutes. So whatever is, however fast the network can run at, that is the speed at which the user will perceive the transaction to be included in a block. Is that right? Yes, that's exactly right. Man. Okay, so uh, so with with these two clarifications, perhaps uh, perhaps we could go into the uh, the most interesting thing, in my opinion, about uh, about Bitcoin NG. Uh, like Bitcoin NG, unlike unlike some of the other scalability approaches, actually defines a set of uh, metrics to measure uh, the health and the fairness of Bitcoin at different block sizes, and uh, and then the proposal t improves on. Uh, how how you can achieve scale without sacrificing any of these metrics. So Itai, could you explain what some of these metrics for measuring the health of Bitcoin are and uh, give us plain uh, plain explanations of what they are trying to measure? Uh, so uh, we we should start, I guess, with the fairness uh, fairness metrics. Um, uh, sorry, uh, with the security metrics. Uh, I'll start with fairness. Uh, you, we want the system to be fair. So if you're uh, mining in the system, you should get uh, revenue that's proportional to the mining power that you own. And the reason is that if fairness is broken, then uh, miners will tend to form big pools uh, because big pools have an advantage, uh, an unfair advantage. And if uh, miners tend to form large pools, this they might tend towards a majority and and uh, break the, the basic premise of, of the decentralization. Uh, and so fairness is a big issue. Uh, the second uh, security metric we introduce is uh, mining power utilization, which means how much of the mining power in the system is actually used to secure the system. And specifically for Bitcoin, this means uh, the, the amount, the ratio of blocks that end up in the main chain. If you create a block and it ends up uh, outside the main chain in a pruned branch, then this block did not contribute to security. An attacker uh, needs less power in order to compete with, a, uh, with the main network. And uh, whatever changes we, we, are, uh, we want to make in Bitcoin, we need to make sure uh, that these two these two metrics uh, remain uh, where they should be. So we should have fairness, and we should be utilizing as much mining power as we can. So there are also some uh, some uh, uh, performance measures at tie. Do you want to talk a little bit about the consensus uh, consensus delay and some of the other yeah. performance metrics? 
Yeah, so for performance, I think uh, th there are a few of these. I'll explain them uh, uh, very roughly. Um, one is uh, what we call consensus delay. And uh, th this is somehow a funny term for uh, the distributed systems people uh, uh, such as myself. Because uh, um, consensus is something that's supposed to be uh, uh, absolute in the, in the classic literature. Uh, and in Bitcoin, it's not absolute. It's always with high probability. You try to reach a point where everybody agree on history. Uh, but uh, blockchains are probabilistic, uh, probabilistic protocols. And so uh, nodes may change their mind. And so what we ask ourselves is how long back do we need to look in order to probably have everyone agree on history. So if we look 10 minutes ago, then 90% of the nodes agree on what happened before that. Um, and so we want the consensus delay to be short. We want uh, to all agree on what happened one second ago. That may not be possible because it takes time to propagate information across the internet, but let's all agree on what happened 20 seconds ago. That's already already great. In Bitcoin, it's closer to 10 minutes because that's the interval between blocks. Um, the second thing is a bit more practical, I guess, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to deal with Bitcoin as, as a user. Uh, this is how long it will take you to realize that you're in a branch. So say you're in a branch, how long it would usually take you or with 90% probability take you until you realize that you were actually on a branch and you should switch to the main chain. Uh, and uh, again, here we want uh, we want uh, to have a short time. So we want to realize very fast that we're on a branch and we are uh, actually switching to the main chain. Let's take a short break so we can go to Paris. I stopped into La Maison du Bitcoin, situated in the heart of Paris's startup scene, and I met with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger CEO, to talk about the Ledger Nano. The Ledger Nano is a Bitcoin hardware wallet based on a secure element. It is on a USB form factor that you plug directly inside your computer and it will manage all your private keys. The signature of transactions will be done inside the secure element, thus never revealing the private keys to the host computer. It is compatible with our own Ledger Wallet Chrome app, which you can also use for multi-signature with Copay or CoinKite, and a large range of third-party applications such as Mycelium, Electrum, GreenBits, Green Address, and so on. The Nano also exists as a cool bracelet wearable, so you can always wear proudly your Bitcoins on your wrist. The Ledger Nano is an easy to use hardware storage option, which doesn't compromise on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the offer code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So perhaps perhaps I can, I can, I can recollect all of these. So you have uh, you have proposed what are the security metrics, which is which is fairness, which means as a mining pool grows bigger and bigger in size, it should not get more and more uh, blocks disproportionate to what the mining power it has. So if it has if it has twenty percent mining power, it should only get twenty percent blocks. It this, the protocol should not be such that it ends up getting twenty five percent of the blocks when it only has twenty percent of the power. The uh, the uh, the other ones were uh, utilization that mining power should not be wasted that most of the mining that is done should enter the main chain and then you have uh, the practical uh, uh, practical metrics like consensus delay which measures uh, 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 like what what do all of the nodes agree on in in in, in history so if I run a node and if uh, Goon is running a node in Cornell. And uh, if we agree that 10 minutes before this point or these certain set of transactions were in the blockchain and both of us agree on the same set of transactions and all of the nodes in the world agree on that same set of transactions, then the consensus delay is like 10 minutes. So 10, 10 minutes before this point, whatever happened in the network is agreed on by all of the nodes in the, in the network. And then you had uh, metrics which were... Uh, how much time does it take for me running a node to realize that I am on a branch, not on the main chain of the node, when the main chain has already diverged from me? 
that, right? that that's precisely right. And so these are in addition to traditional distributed systems metrics like throughput and latency. Uh, those are very well established. Everybody understands what throughput means. That's the number of transactions you can clear per second. Uh, everybody knows what latency means. That's the time from submission of a transaction to the time at which you can consider it uh, committed for some degree of assurance that you need. Um, so I think I want to contextualize the, this, the work here a little bit. Um, so we kind of delved into the metrics very, very quickly. Um, but uh, the debate about scalability and sort of changes to the Bitcoin protocol has been marked by sort of vague qualitative concerns. And, you know, I have a lot of vague qualitative concerns about a lot of things in life, right? And I can get worried about them to no end. Um, so what we tried to do here was actually attach some quantitative measurements to these vague qualitative concerns. Like people talk about centralization fears. Well, what's the proper way to measure this? And, uh, and I think what we came up with in this paper are concrete, um, sort of absolute, and I think universally agreed upon uh, ways of actually quantifying a number that says, well, this is the, the level of concern we should have, or this is the impact it's going to have on this concern. So that, I think, alone, uh, when we started doing this work, well, that was our first instinct was, let's try to move this from sort of qualitative uh, problems and sort of uh, arm waving to a scientific basis. And the way to do this is to start with an actual, um, an actual measurable set of, uh, of uh, metrics that we could use to evaluate protocols. So that's what you saw there. Um, we skipped the, the basic ones that everybody agrees on, like throughput and latency. We talked about the new ones that we introduced just so we can evaluate new proposals. And you've built a system with which you can actually emulate and measure these, uh, uh, these factors. Can you talk about the experimentation platform that you've uh, developed? Yeah, so I'm really excited about this. This is uh, work done by Itai, um, uh, another student, uh, Adem F. A. Genjar, my colleague Robert Van Unessi, and myself. And uh, what we did was uh, to build a, a platform uh, for emulating large-scale distributed systems, in particular tailored towards emulating the Bitcoin network. So as you know, the Bitcoin overlay network consists of about 6,500 publicly reachable nodes. And, uh, and people ask questions about this, and people have a lot of concerns about uh, proposed changes to the protocol. And, um, and we need to be able to, I think, uh, evaluate them in some experimental setting and say, look, you know, this new proposal will actually behave in this particular fashion in the wild. So we built this, uh, this emulation framework to answer questions like this. So how does this work? In essence, we have a large number of machines um, at Cornell. Uh, we have about, uh, in fact, well, so we have about 500 machines with eight cores each. So that's 4,000 cores. We weren't able to use all of them. Uh, until now, we used about 1,000 cores. Uh, to, to run virtual machines corresponding to, uh, to uh, the, uh, the actual full nodes at large in the Bitcoin network. Our vision is that we're going to, to have a one-to-one -one, uh, one -to -one emulation platform. I don't know if you guys have seen these like miniature cities that people build, you know, the miniature Berlin, miniature Istanbul, miniature London, and so forth. Um, so think of the emulation platform as something like a miniature city. Right? So you have the actual network at large uh, on the internet. Uh, what we've built in the lab is a copy of that internet um, with uh, latencies between the... So for example, there will be a node in Nova Scotia, there will be a node at Cornell, etc. Uh, and we have in the lab emulated the delays and the bandwidth limitations between those nodes. So what we can do is uh, we can actually run everything inside the, the lab environment and send messages from one, the virtual Nova Scotia node to the virtual Cornell node and have it take as much time as it would take in the real internet in the real world and therefore uh, simulate, uh, therefore not emulate and see what the, how the protocol would behave if we were to deploy it in the world at large. So we can answer questions without experimenting on, on real money, without experimenting on real things of value and without having to disrupt the world. Um, but uh, simply run closed, well-controlled experiments. Okay. So the, what's important here to, to realize is that this is a, an emulation platform and not simulation. So we talked about this before the show a bit. And the important distinction there is that with emulation, you have actual... Uh, you're, you're not making assumptions about uh, how the network will, will react... Uh, 
and only testing certain parts of um, of the protocol, but you're actually testing the entire protocol and and simply simulating the network propagation time. Is that right? That that that's right. So in a simulation environment, what people typically do is they they take the protocol. They write a uh, simplified version of it within a sim simulation framework, um, typically on a single machine, running on one machine, and they need to fit the, the code and, uh, and so forth into, into that sim environment. Uh, in an emulation world like ours, we do are not doing that. We're running the actual code. We run Bitcoin Core, or we can run Bitcoin XT, or we can run Bitcoin NG, or any other protocol that people might come up with. And uh, we simply let it run at its natural speed, um, we can skip some of the bits, like we can skip mining. We don't have to actually spend the cycles to mine. We can, uh, we can sort of uh, create the events where the nodes find uh, the blocks as we, as we con control them from a centralized controller. Um, and uh, we can then perform repeatable measurements across the network uh, using the actual code as it would run. And because we're running the actual code with warts and all, if there is a bug in an, in a, in a, in an implementation, uh, an emulation platform will exercise that bug. It will look at emergent behaviors in the actual code. It will not just test your understanding of it. It will not just test uh, a simplified, pared-down version of it in a simulated environment, but it will actually run the entire code itself. Now, this is really interesting because it actually brings real scientific quanti quantitative data to uh, Bitcoin, which, uh, as you mentioned, is, is missing now because a lot of the debate is arm waving, um, like uh, some some qualitative, some quantitative information, but that perhaps isn't uh, necessarily of, of of good good quality, and a lot of ideological and a, you know just subjectivism that um, that frankly doesn't doesn't really serve the cause. Uh, so let's get into the technical details of NG because there's, there's a lot to talk about here. Can you explain what are the fundamental differences between Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin NG? So I can give you the, the high level view and, uh, and maybe Itai can go into more detail. Um, the, the biggest change, the big difference and, and sort of the 10 seconds takeaway from the NG versus Core uh, is simply that in Core, what you have is a set of miners who are codifying what happened in the preceding 10 minutes or so. They issue a block, and that block records what happened in the past. So it's a retrospective protocol. And, uh, and so that leaves you in a bit of a lurch, because um, what, suppose a block was issued, then we're in some kind of a strange state where we don't know what happened. We're all sort of, every, all of the miners are going at it, trying to come up with the next block. Um, but, but nothing is really set. Uh, we're not really making progress until the next block is issued. And as soon as it's issued, we're back in that funny state again, uh, where there are a bunch of transactions in the mempool, but we don't know which ones are going to make it into the next block. So, um, so that's why Bitcoin Core is retrospective, and it's sort of fundamental to every retrospective protocol. Uh, Bitcoin NG is forward-looking. So the simplest difference is every 10 minutes, there is still mining going on. There is still blocks being issued. But every 10 minutes, what the block that's being issued is doing is it's electing, think of it as a soft leader election. It's not, it's not absolute in some sense. It's, it's easy to usurp leadership from someone else uh, by finding another block. Uh, but every 10 minutes, we designate a leader who from that point on vets the transactions coming in very, very quickly, signs them and says, hey guys, I want this uh, this uh, new incoming transaction to be part of the, the new blockchain. So that takes away that delay between the submission of a transaction until the point you can, uh, uh, you can consider it done. And that also changes the throughput with which transactions can be vetted. So that's sort of the high level intuition. Um, if people take nothing away from this, uh, this episode, I hope they will take away uh, the sort of the, the central operation. And, uh, and the big difference, which is retrospective versus forward-looking. Um, but Itai, do you want to describe the, the sort of the operation of the protocol at a finer detail between key blocks and micro blocks and so forth? Yeah, I, I do want to say something more about the general overview. The basic insight is that uh, Bitcoin today does exactly the same thing, only in the wrong order. Uh, so uh, still every 10 minutes you have a leader election. 
and this chosen leader uh, gets the right to serialize, uh, to order all transactions up to that point. Uh, so leader election already occurs, and once we realized that, we were able to separate the leader election from the serialization. And so we put the leader election in the beginning uh, of the epoch, and for the next 10 minutes, this leader creates, uh, serializes the transactions, and he can do this fast, because there is no other leader until the next one is chosen. There is no competition here, like you had if you created, uh, if, if you uh, tuned the standard Bitcoin to create very frequent blocks. So only the leader can can uh, order the transaction, and he can do so fast with no contention or confusion about what the order is. Uh, technically, this is done by uh, introducing uh, two uh, types of uh, blocks instead of uh, instead of one. We have uh, key blocks, as in key frames, uh, for leader election, and uh, micro blocks uh, that contain the actual transactional data. Um, they're all put in the same chain, so the same blockchain structure as in uh, Bitcoin's blockchain. Uh, the key blocks are generated with proof of work every 10 minutes or so. So really think Bitcoin, uh, the, the same Bitcoin mechanism. So if you don't have an issue with, uh, with the security uh, properties today, so suffer from too many forks, then with 10 minute key blocks, you're still fine. And uh, between these key blocks, the miner gets to create these micro blocks uh, very frequently think 10 seconds uh, it can be smaller than the time it takes for messages to propagate through the network uh, it's a really tunable uh, tunable parameter and the micro blocks can be whatever size you want according to how much uh, processing you think the individual node can the individual nodes can do and you tune these parameters and you make the, you set them in the protocol and uh, you let it go. And so roughly every 10 minutes, a new leader is chosen and that leader serializes transactions frequently uh, to, to uh, create the ledger. And so as a user, you don't need to wait for 10 minutes until your transaction is, gets its first confirmation. You only need to wait for, for your transaction to be placed in the micro block, say 10 seconds plus the propagation time in the network, just to make sure there is no key block you haven't heard of. So, so that's, that's certainly a very interesting idea. So that fundamentally means that suppose I, I am a miner uh, in Switzerland, which I dev- never would be, but suppose I'm a miner in Switzerland and I managed to find the next, uh, next uh, suppose I managed to find the proof of work puzzle. So 10 minutes ago, somebody else had solved the proof of work puzzle. And from his puzzle, I kept on finding the, kept on plugging in random numbers and I found the solution. Then uh, what will happen to me is for the next 10 minutes, I will get the power to listen to transactions happening in the network and generate as many micro blocks as I want to and put these transactions in those micro blocks for the next 10 minutes, right? Absolutely. Uh, I think Itai's explanation is, was exactly right on. In, in Bitcoin, um, the core, regular core, uh, what you were doing was you were getting elected as a leader and at that time you were committing to the shape of the block for the last 10 minutes. And now uh, when you do the proof of work puzzle, that gives you the right, so that it gives you a deferred ability to uh, construct the block as you go along. So once you find the proof of work, you are then able to craft the exact, um, the exact set of transactions that you want. Today's magic word is scaling, S-C-A-L-I-N-G. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So, so for example, let's let's consider the scenario where, um, where 10 minutes ago, some, some miner in Xinjiang province had won a block, and he was creating these small, tiny micro blocks and putting the transactions in those blocks. And now, right at this moment, I end up winning the winning the next block. So I, I became the leader. So why should and so why so why should I include the other guys' blocks, the Chinese miners' blocks in the blockchain that I will build on? Why wh- wh- wouldn't I be incentivized to just skip his blocks that are putting the transactions in? And uh, 
not put his blocks in because I can earn transaction fees from those transactions which the Chinese mine miner was trying to earn fees. For example, let's say let's say there was a let's say the Chinese guy won the block ten minutes ago and there was Sebastian transferring some bitcoins to Brian five minutes ago and he paid a transaction fee of one bitcoin. Now uh, ideally like the Chinese guy would would win that one bitcoin because he put the transaction in his micro block. But then when I am the miner, am I not incentivized to ex try to put Sebastian's transaction in my own micro block so that I earn the transaction fee instead of the Chinese guy? That's a very good question. Uh, that, that was the, the main challenge in devising this. So uh, what, what you're basically saying is, is uh, incentive, incentive compatibility. The, the incentives uh, for playing uh, the way we want the participants to play have to be aligned. And the way we do this is that uh, we split the transaction fees in a somewhat non-intuitive way. So when you place a transaction in a micro block, if you're a leader, you only get 40% of the revenue and the subsequent leader gets 60%. And the reason is that now the subsequent leader is better off following your transaction, getting the 60% uh, fee, then putting it in his own epoch and getting only 40%. So the, the current leader gets 40% of the fee, the transaction fee, and the subsequent miner will get 60% of the transaction fees that were paid on, on that transaction. Yeah. Okay. So I had a question regarding confirmations. Uh, does this mean then, since we have these very short blocks, these very short blocked uh, confirmation intervals, that a transaction can get to six confirmations within, for instance, 60 seconds? Is, is that ab about right? I wouldn't match the micro block uh, confirmations to Bitcoin confirmations uh, because you don't, they don't require proof of work. So be, being placed in a micro block, Absolutely. Okay. Can you explain the distinction there? So can, can, what, what would be a good measure by which we could say, okay, this confirmation is, this transaction is valid and we can assume that it's not a decimal spend or something like that. So to, to get, uh, to get uh, six uh, proof of work confirmations uh, like in Bitcoin, you will need to wait for six key blocks just as in Bitcoin. But your first confirmation is going to come very quickly, uh, just as we said before. So being placed in a micro block means uh, is, is your first confirmation. The subsequent uh, micro blocks are not significant. They don't add to your security. If you want to have uh, more proof of work securing your, uh, securing your transaction, then you need to wait for more proof of work to come into the network in the form of key blocks. I think the, the way to look at this is at the moment, uh, if, so there's this whole example about buying coffee with Bitcoin. And uh, so the elephant in the room is it doesn't really work unless the merchant is willing to take a huge risk, right? I go up to, to buy something. I issue my transaction. It's in the mempool. Nobody knows what's going to happen to it. Uh, it's just sitting there. I could easily issue a double spend. There is now double spend as a service. So it's become a lot easier to even do this. And, uh, and what, you, what you really want to do is, is you know, so, I mean, the, mine, the, the merchant can always take a zero conf, uh, confirmation transaction, but he's taking a risk. So with NG, uh, I will issue my transaction. The moment that transaction is signed by the current leader, uh, it's as if it's, it's uh, equivalent to having been mined in a single block. So whereas there was the retrospective blocks in the past before, now we have the miner saying, hey, I am the miner who was authorized to, to issue uh, uh, and, and vet transactions. I'm vetting this new transaction to be in the next block. So, so think of those as one confirmation transactions, and they carry approximately the same weight as a Bitcoin single confirmation. And suddenly you can do in a few seconds um, what you couldn't do uh, before in Bitcoin until 10 minutes had passed away. So uh, that's that's a very interesting idea that I, uh, I I do a transaction and I actually get the confirmation maybe in 5 or 10 seconds as long as it takes my message to propagate and the miner to sign and for his block to propagate in the network. 
but uh, the question then becomes what what holds back the miner from creating two blocks at the same height and putting conflicting transactions in those two blocks so for example let's say i want to double spend and i am in a coffee shop wanting to double spend and i create two transactions one to the coffee shop one back to me propagate both both of those in the network and let's say it's a miner in taiwan that won the block what prevents the miner in taiwan from creating two different blocks at the same height in block number 1 he puts my transaction going to the coffee person coffee seller and in the block number 2 at the same height he puts the transaction going back to me so these two transactions are in conflict but they are in the blockchain at the same height so the the one confirmation the immediate confirmation i get from that miner is of is is of less value for the person who's selling the coffee right so you are putting your finger that's a great question you're putting your finger on the second biggest challenge when designing the ng protocol and uh, we do not want miners doing this miners who uh, essentially assist in other people's double spends should be uh, sh should not be incentivized by the protocol in fact they should be punished and uh, in this case we have a notion of a poison transaction and uh, any any miner caught doing uh, a double spend like this will end up forfeiting their block reward plus all of the transaction fees that they uh, that they vetted. So there's a a very easy way for other people to recognize and say, "Hey, I caught this miner doing something really odd," and uh, provide proof of it. And you will notice that for for you to actually for not you, but in in the example you gave, for the miner to to assist with that double spend, he has to leave behind incontrovertible proof. Of his malfeasance, so somebody else can say, can come by and say, "Look, I caught this miner issuing these two kinds of blocks at the micro blocks at the same height, and uh, uh, and that is not that is not good, and therefore you should take away the uh, the block reward from him." So it, this is similar to what uh, Ethereum has proposed, which is the slasher algorithm. The, um, uh, the sl slasher is a proof of stake algorithm. That I'm the relation I know is the proof of fraud. Uh, and they also use proof of fraud, uh, like um, like other examples, and uh, it's 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 a good technique to avoid uh, to prevent an attacker by retrospectively uh, preventing the revenue. Uh, in NG, what we achieve with this is that uh, really the um, a malicious miner that uh, forks the, the uh, micro blockchains he's, he's in charge of, he gets punished just the same way that the standard Bitcoin miner is punished if, uh, if he tries to fork the network. I mean, you're spending resources and you might lose them. Uh, in NG, it's even worse. You're definitely going to lose them because you will be proved uh, uh, as, as a fraudster. Let's take a short break and talk about Hide.me. You know, setting up a VPN on multiple devices can be complicated. Let's say you want to do like three devices and you have 10 different exit nodes that you want to configure. Well, that's 30 different configurations that you have to do manually in each of those devices OS, and that can take a long time. Hide.me makes this super easy with their apps. So they have apps for Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. So you just install the app, log in, and boom, you're ready to use VPN with Hide.me. So this is perfect if you're traveling, you just install the app on your devices and say you're using public Wi-Fi, you turn on the app, you connect, and you're completely protected against hacking, man in the middle attacks, or any type of malicious activity. And of course, the apps work with their free plan. To try out their free plan, head to hide.me slash epicenter. It includes two gigabytes of data, which is more than enough to keep you protected when you go traveling. It also includes three exit nodes in Singapore, Amsterdam, and Montreal. And if you use RURL, so hide.me slash epicenter, it's going to give you 35% off if you ever decide to sign up for a premium account. And their premium account includes unlimited data. It includes up to five devices connected simultaneously. So you can put your grandmother using a VPN, even your dog's tablet you can put on a VPN. Uh, and you can use any of their exit nodes and they've got 30 exit nodes all over the world. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. 
So give it a try and we would like to thank Hi.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So the other question then is, um, you, uh, you, your, your research group uh, spent a lot of effort to uh, outline selfish mining as a strategy where uh, a miner can mine uh, a block and keep it secret and try to mine on that block uh, for some time and when he gets two blocks in a row then publish both of those blocks at the same time. And this has the advantage that once a miner keeps a block he created secret, he gets he he knows what block to build on, but the other guys don't. So, uh, how does Bitcoin NG link to selfish mining? Does it does it improve on uh, improve on vanilla Bitcoin in its resistance to selfish mining, or is it or does it make a difference at all? Bitcoin NG shares much of the same trust assumptions as Bitcoin Core. Um, in fact, in many ways, it's, uh, this, this is one of the big selling points of Bitcoin NG is you don't, we're not coming up with any changes to the core uh, trustworthiness of the protocol. So, uh, so in this regard, our exposure to selfish mining is no worse than, uh, than Bitcoin Core. We do not improve on it either. The selfish mining work uh, provided a patch for uh, selfish miners. We, we had a fix where we ruled out um, the possibility of selfish mining by miners who own less than 25% of the hashing power. So uh, that was the selfish mining work. Bitcoin NG has no bearing on, uh, on selfish mining at all. I, I, if I can just interject here, it, it is not uh, trivial that it doesn't have any bearing. Our initial design uh, made it very vulnerable, so it's it's by by uh, uh, careful crafting that that it is not more vulnerable to to selfish mining. The incentives have to be had to be carefully tuned. Thanks, Atai. <laughs> let, <laughs> let's not overlook your hard work. <laughs> so, like one of the concerns that comes to me is if I am a miner on Bitcoin NG, um, suddenly I I need to take care of uh, of my private uh, of. Um, I need to sign micro blocks for 10 minutes and I need to handle my private key for those 10 minutes, have, have it in my hot wallet or so and keep on signing these micro blocks. And uh, this, this kind of uh, creates new kinds of things that I need to do. And doesn't it also create the risk that um, in those 10 minutes, somebody is going to uh, partition me off the network or create a denial of service attack against me and prevent me for, from he can't prevent me from signing the blocks, but at least publishing the blocks and propagating it to the network uh, correctly. So you're right that there is a there is a tiny bit of a concern there, but let's let's be careful about one cr critical fact: we are not electing an IP address as the leader. What's happening with key blocks is we're picking a key uh, that's going to serve as the next leader. So. Um, so it's, there are a gazillion techniques for how to get that key out to remote locations, multiple different locations. And uh, there are lots and lots of well-understood techniques for protecting um, websites and other services from denial of service attacks. Um, it's not just uh, you, Meher, who needs to, to, to be protected. It's, you just have to get your, the ability to sign to a bunch of clones of yours and uh, any one of them can can serve this function. And so what prevents, is there any way to prevent this or is this uh, just a concern that we're ready to live with? Um, I think it's just a, essentially the way I think of this is if you were to, to layer Bitcoin NG on top of the Bitcoin network, you have all of the same features of Bitcoin. So you could, in the, if you wanted to, you could make the key blocks big and uh, therefore uh, end up having every 10 minutes a big block, just like you do in Bitcoin. But plus, have the ability to fill that time between the blocks with micro blocks being issued. And uh, on occasion, let's say there is a uh, there are uh, miners that get DDoSed. Well, then they do, and we're no worse off than we've been in the past. Um, and that is the worst worst case scenario. So I don't really. This is not something that I lose sleep over. It's uh, it seems to me like. A, uh, like we're strictly giving you an ability that you did not have before. So, uh, in, in terms of the metrics that we introduced before, what does uh, Bitcoin NG improve on over over XT as we as we try to put more and more transactions into the blockchain per minute or per ten minutes? 
Dann äh, NG, äh, XT's Blockchain äh, is äh, similar to Bitcoin's Blockchain and so äh, it would reach the same äh, scalability äh, limits that, that, that it does. Äh, for short term, I think that there can be improvements, improvement done on the Bitcoin Blockchain by, by parameter tune-up. Uh, there's no reason to think that the one megabyte limit that we have now is the limit that after which everything suddenly breaks. Um, the, if, eventually, if the system uh, grows uh, grows enough, then we will hit these limits. And uh, before we reach this, reach this point, the uh, uh, scalability uh, the scalability limits have to be uh, removed. Uh, th this is what uh, the Bitcoin NG protocol uh, is aimed to do. So if you look at our emulations on the experimental platform, um, and what you can see is uh, there are a bunch of things that people can do to a standard blockchain protocol. Let's say take core and make the kinds of changes that XT is proposing, which is make the blocks bigger. Uh, or you could make the block intervals smaller. The two are essentially isomorphic in some sense. Um, and we looked at doing both of these things. And when you do that, as you get the blocks bigger and bigger, or as you get the block intervals smaller and smaller, at some point the network breaks down. And, uh, and that's, that breakdown occurs because the, the information isn't propagating fast enough, lots of forks are being produced. And in terms of the metrics we mentioned before, uh, when forks are, are going, when the fork rate is going up, then blocks are being wasted. So minor utilization uh, or mining, total utilized mining power is dropping because some poor miner is coming up with blocks that are in forks and are not really making their way into the main blockchain. Um, fairness often goes down because big miners are at an advantage and the small miners who are coming up with, uh, with, blo with blocks are typically at these regimes with the typical traditional protocols they are the ones at risk, they're the ones losing uh, blocks to, due to forks. And if, if in contrast you look at what's happening with Bitcoin NG, the response is, is typically flat, uh, where you see regular Bitcoin Core or XT type approaches sort of doing this non-linear phase transition from operating more or less okay to just breaking down. And, uh, and that's because Bitcoin NG can, can sort of very smoothly handle uh, these uh, high rates uh, due to its different, slightly different protocol. So let, let's talk about what would be required and the sort of changes required to stakeholders uh, in, in Bitcoin in order for NG to be implemented. Um, presumably, since the headers are different, this would affect wallets. Uh, it would affect also miners because they would need to change their software. Can you talk about sort of the the changes needed in order for this to take place, and do you think that's likely that uh, that they, that they would happen? So let me start with the most important stakeholder, and I'll hand off to Itai for the rest. The most important stakeholder are the clients, right? So the, your wallets um, and uh, SPV clients would not have to know anything at all, right? So they have to be changed none at all. And that is a huge win for this, uh, this the, the realizability of this protocol. Um, the, uh, your, your regular old client software that is SPV connected, your Mycelium's and so forth, they can just continue to operate. They issue transactions oblivious of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, they, they do queries to full nodes, uh, not having to know anything about this protocol change. So I see that as a huge win. That, that is a pretty pretty impressive win, I guess. Uh, if most wallets don't have to make any changes, uh, that's that's a huge advantage. Yeah, no significant changes, at least. I mean, you need to uh, acknowledge the different structure of the of the key blocks and the, and the micro blocks because micro blocks don't carry proof of work, so their validation is is a little different. Uh, but but these are really technical changes. There is no fundamental difference. Um, as for for the miners, there is really no difference at all uh, because the, they're mining on a, on a uh, on a block uh, on a block header. So if the block is structured correctly and this can be done in a backward compatible way, then uh, the mining hardware can can continue to work without change. So I think the changes really are, uh, I guess, to two 
two on 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 two fronts, um, right? It's I. So one is on the merchant side, uh, merchant seeking confirmation. Um, depending on the level of uh, confirmation they need, uh, they will want to understand the, the, the form, the structure of a microblock and wait for a single confirmation. Um, and, uh, and full nodes, of course, have to be, you know, have to, have to change to, to deal with the new, uh, new structure. Um, but miners themselves don't have to, regular old miners don't have to change. Mining pool operators, uh, they are the ones affected the most. They need to understand that uh, they now are, are tasked with a slightly different way of, of codifying a block. Instead of making it all at once, they, make, they essentially buy the right to make a block and then piecemeal create the block on the fly. So, uh, so that's, I think, the biggest changes to the mining pool operators. So then wallet, wallet, SPV wallets don't have to change anything. Individual miners mining for mining pools don't have to change. So what are we left with? We're left with uh, payment providers, people running full node clients, and mining pools having to change the way that they operate? I think broadly this is correct. Okay. And it, are we talking about a, so we're talking about a hard fork then for those stakeholders? Um, yes, probably. Um, there, there is a well, a hard fork for the for the network itself. So, if you wanted to make this change to the Bitcoin, then you're changing the uh, consensus protocol, and so you're looking at a hard fork. Uh, yeah, pro pro probably a hard fork. I don't. I'm not sure this can be done in any way with a soft fork. But this is a, this is a challenge, let's say. Yeah. So this sort of brings us to the question of this whole scalability debate and the question of governments, which we've uh, talked about on the show before. Um, what 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 is your what are your general thoughts on on this on this whole debate and, and how it's played out and what what types of governments do you think that we would need uh, in order for for Bitcoin to you know, go forth and, and be able to implement changes like this, which are, I think we can all agree, important for the health of the, of the network. So the, um, I, I think that the community is really maturing due to this uh, uh, scalability uh, debate, uh, which, which was uh, kind of rough at times, uh, but, but, but it's good. Uh, it should be rough. It's uh, these uh, the scalability question and the hard for questions are bo both deserve uh, a rough discussion, uh, and the, the tones got kind of high. Uh, the, the 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 big uh, task I think is to be able to to make decisions uh, even if there is no uh, unanim unanimity. And to be able to move the protocol forward, uh, I think that, I mean, Bitcoin already has some uh, some competitors, and there will be more. Uh, and uh, I think that if Bitcoin wants to to keep its lead, uh, then it needs to have uh, this, some level of uh, safe and confer and conservative uh, agility and and uh, power to to change uh, due to need. So I agree. I think uh, the discussion so far has been, um, a, a, I would say actually it's been far, far harsher than it needed to be and far less scientific than it needed to be. I would have liked to see a discussion uh, with uh, a, a bit more hard numbers and uh, less sort of vague concerns and more actual demonstrated issues. Um, so I think we're slowly making our way towards that. Um, but... Uh, uh, but it, I think it's still an open question. I mean, it might really be that uh, the, the entire network is paralyzed, that we are unable to make any changes at all to the core protocol. And if that's the case, it's really a pity uh, because that would have marked, if it, that were true, and I, I would like to believe it's not true, if, if it were true, it would, it would mark the end of evolution, end of lifetime for Bitcoin. Um, if, if we really cannot make any changes whatsoever, then, then the, our only option is to, to make the technology better is to move on to a new coin, to a new blockchain, 
and uh, um, and that might well you know that might well be what's in our future and I hope not um, I would really like us to see a coherent cohesive single community I would like us to be able to to roll out new changes I would like us to be able to discuss them in a civilized fashion without censorship without uh, without uh, you know uh, feathers getting ruffled as as uh, and, and people going out there to ruffle other people's feathers and so forth. So I would like to see that discussion happen scientifically and in an orderly fashion. Um, so, so yeah, um, so I'm not sure that we are there, really. I'm, I'm not as optimistic as uh, Itai seems to be. Um, I have faith in the people, I guess, but, uh, but I haven't really seen that faith demonstrated and, and sort of take actual shape in, in at least the discussions I've seen so far. I, I completely agree. And I think, uh, as you pointed out, one of the reasons why this debate got sort of, I don't want to use the word out of hand, but people did sort of go uh, outside of, well, it's a lack of scientific uh, of scientific data, like you said, you know, a, a lot of the uh, uh, arguments are either based on on some qualitative data or or, or simply just pure subjectivity and uh, the lack of scientific data and the lack of, of quality of quantitative data, uh, I think uh, played a lot in how this debate sort of got out of hand. And the fact that now you, you know, that uh, you've developed this emulation system, uh, which with, with which you can actually uh, test and, and, and see how um, these protocols proposals would actually play out in sort of a real world scenario is, is great for, for Bitcoin as a whole. Yeah, we think so. Um, you know, indeed. So there are, anytime you propose a change, somebody will come up with, you know, umpteen different concerns. And there are so many things I am concerned about in real life, right? Um, and if I wanted to be really deathly scared of something, I really could make myself deathly scared of vague hand wavy concerns of all kinds. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we deal with a lot of risks and, 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 and sort of disruption due to change and so forth. And, uh, and when you, what, the way we deal with it is we just look at the numbers and say, you know, yeah, I could be worried about an asteroid hitting me. I could be worried about some change I make having all sorts of cascade effects down the line, all having all sorts of tertiary, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, st uh, trickle-down effects. Um, but, but really, to a first order of approximation, a lot of these concerns are overblown. Um, also, I think a lot of the debate has been turned into ideological or political uh, discussions, even though at its core it's a technical discussion. So I would very much like to see us discuss it as if it's a scientific issue with numbers, uh, with uh, proper measurements. And not not just uh, uh, convert everything to an ideological discussion. That is not to say that there aren't political ramifications. Uh, they, they will always be some when you talk about something like a monetary system. Um, but we can compartmentalize those and discuss them separately. I, I, I'm afraid that a lot of the technical discussion has derailed itself, and uh, and there may or may not be a way to actually roll out new changes. I, I, I worry that if Bitcoin might have gotten too stale, and I hope it hasn't. I hope that we can enact meaningful change. In order to push like Bitcoin NG forward, um, do you have some kind of uh, some kind of ballpark uh, numbers on how how better, uh, how more scalable Bitcoin NG could be over plain vanilla Bitcoin, like? two orders of magnitude or do you have like rough figures on what what is possible today with a proposal like bitcoin ng and what may be possible in the future while adopting some other sharding mechanisms that that you or other people are working on so so yeah so i think at a high level uh, there are multiple different approaches to achieving scalability so we i think uh, put our stake down and and sort of um paved the way to one particular approach, um, which is this uh, forward-looking protocols that vet after the fact. Um, there are other techniques, like you mentioned, like sharding, which is something we also are looking into. Um, and there are also other techniques like the Lightning Network and sidechains and so forth that each bring something new. Um, we see all of these techniques as being complementary. Um, so uh, I think I'm a little, little wary of doing a comparison, uh, you know, essentially, it's 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 sort of um, 
I don't want to get into a, you know, a 2.5 versus 2.7 kind of an argument here. Uh, qualitatively speaking, we go from having a, a single confirmation in every 10 minutes to having a confirmation on a transaction in a matter of seconds, where that seconds is proportional to the diameter of the network uh, in, 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 in Bitcoin. And, and the current network diameter seems to be on the order of maybe 10 to 20 uh, seconds or so. So to reach, you know, I have to quantify and qualify a lot of these statements to be really precise. Um, but uh, because we're not talking about reaching every single host, we're talking about reaching a fairly large number and so forth. But, uh, but, uh, but I think that alone is, uh, is a few orders of magnitude improvement over, over Bitcoin. Okay. So... So, this is, so that certainly is a is a very important improvement over Bitcoin and would be very practical uh, because uh, it is better than a zero confirmation transaction for uh, for a merchant, for example. So, what are the kind of next steps that you are thinking about regarding the regarding two things regarding your proposal and be your emulation network because that is uh, very interesting in itself. So, what what are the things that you, that your group is looking to tackle in the next year or so? So for the emulation network, uh, we're looking at um, uh, learning more about the properties of, uh, of blockchain and alternative uh, uh, chain behaviors. Um, we want to have uh, larger and uh, uh, realistic uh, measurements. Uh, for NG itself, uh, we just published the idea and we're uh, curious to see uh, who, who will uh, who will pick it up and what will be done with it? Uh, our contribution here is the is the protocol where we're not uh, working on on um, uh, commercializing it at this point. Yeah, this is a pure research contribution. We're happy to see it rolled into a coin. We're happy to see it rolled into core. We're happy to see it used in side chains. Uh, essentially, it's just uh, an, a new idea out there to improve the state of the art in blockchain technologies. And uh, as Itai said, we do not have a commercial conflict of interest on this front. It's just pure, regular old scientific research. Well, it's uh, definitely an interesting proposal. And uh, I mean, I, th I think that the, it, it does address a lot of these scalability issues in a way that hasn't, obviously hasn't been uh, proposed before. And hopefully you know, this will sort of get picked up and, and and brought into the debate, uh, you know, and confronted with some of these other proposals like XT and the BIP 100s and so forth. And uh, you know, hopefully we can come to some sort of consensus uh, around these scalability issues and, and take Bitcoin forward and, and, and move it into the new, you know, the, move it into the, uh, the, the new financial revolution so that, so that it can replace you know, all of these things that we would like it to replace. So thank, thanks very much, guys, for joining us today. Uh, it was a little short notice, and it's a little early there. So um, thank you for, for joining us so, so early in the, in the morning. Thanks, Sebastian. Thanks, Meher. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, our pleasure to be here. So to our listeners, thanks so much for joining us. We're Epicenter Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. You can find all of uh, the LTB network shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Uh, we release new episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday. You can watch the video version of the show on youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And you can also listen to the audio version on iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, or wherever you get your podcasts. It could be a podcaster app on Android or Windows phone. We're available pretty much anywhere as well as Stitcher. Uh, if you'd like to follow us on Twitter, we're at Epicenter, sorry, twitter.com slash Epicenter BTC. And uh, you can always leave us a tip and we'll the tipping address will be in the show description. And by the way, if you're interested in getting an Epicenter Bitcoin t-shirt, you can do that by just going to iTunes and leaving us a review. Uh, or it could be any other platform, like if you listen to us on Stitcher or, or anywhere else, and you can leave us a review there. Just uh, leave a review and then send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com to let us know that uh, you've done so. And we'll send you one of these cool Epicenter Bitcoin t-shirts. So thanks again for listening, and we'll be back next week. Bye.